In this video, we're going to dig into analysis of automotive differentials. We're going to focus on the vehicle level analysis, looking at kinematics, force, power, and so on. And here we're going to look specifically at what's called an open differential. This is where the rotational speed of the outboard wheel and the rotational speed of the inboard wheel, omega O and omega I, can be different. Specifically, there's no mechanism to influence the torque distribution, whereas in differentials that are not standard open differentials, there may be some sort of mechanism to influence the distribution of torque across the wheels on a single axle. So, for example, we could have a system using some type of electronic torque vectoring. This uses mechanisms within the anti-lock braking system to actually apply brakes to help control power and force applied at each of these wheels. This is usually part of the traction control system and the overall vehicle stability control system. There are also systems that use passive mechanisms for influencing torque distribution across the inboard and outboard sides of the vehicle. For example, using clutches, mechanical clutches within limited slip differentials. And then finally, another type of differential to be aware of is a locking differential. And this is often used in off-road vehicles where when conditions require or the operator commands it, then we constrain that the outboard wheel velocity is equal to the inboard wheel velocity. And there are some special vehicles that may use a straight axle or sometimes called a spool where there are no differential gears in the middle. We just have the ring and pinion to transmit the rotational power from the drive shaft to the, the rear shafts that drive the wheels. That's not very useful for a, a typical car that's driving around town, uh, but if you need to go in a straight line really fast, then that could be a, a really useful thing. Or maybe for off-highway equipment, maybe this sort of arrangement is desirable. We're going to go through a derivation of the fundamental kinematics, looking at the vehicle level. I should point out, I highly recommend that if you haven't done so recently, please go through the lecture video that focuses on gear trains and specifically multi-degree of freedom gear trains. Differentials, and here specifically symmetric differentials, these are one of the types of gear trains that we covered in a fair amount of depth in this previous lecture. And we're going to use some of the results of kinematic and other types of analyses that we laid out in that previous lecture. So if you've not gone through that yet, please pause here and, and go back to the previous lecture. And then after we go through derivation of the fundamental kinematics, we're going to work through a numerical example that I hope will make these concepts more clear. So what I've sketched here is supposed to be a top view of a car, a passenger car, that's going around a curve. So it has longitudinal velocity v in the forward direction of the vehicle. Um, and it's going around this curve, so v is pointed in the direction of the curve. And these wheels are being turned, and they are being steered at what we call the steering angle. Here I'm going to use delta to represent the steering angle. And at least at this very instant in time, we can think of this vehicle as turning about an instant center. And the distance between the center of mass of this vehicle and the instant center is this radius value r. Some other quantities that we're going to need to know include what's called the track width. This is the distance between the center of the inboard and the outboard wheels. And with that definition, I can write that the radius or the distance between the outboard wheel and the instant center is equal to r, the distance from the center of the vehicle to the instant center, plus one half of the track width, and then similarly r sub i, the distance from the inboard wheel center 
to the instant center is r plus one half w. Let's zoom in on the velocities of the rear wheels. Suppose over here on the right hand side is the instant center. And here we have the mass center or the, the center of the vehicle moving at a velocity v. And to overcome different types of resistance, rolling resistance, air resistance, we need to have some force operating in this direction. And I'm going to label that as F. And then over here, we have a velocity, a forward velocity of the outboard wheel. And then over here, we have a forward velocity of the inboard wheel. As the car is going around a corner, if we imagine a line connecting it out to the instant center, this is going to be rotating about the instant center with an angular velocity, omega ic. And of course, not every turn is perfectly circular. So at the next instant in time, the instant center might be somewhere else and the radius might be a different value. What would happen if we had a locked differential or a straight shaft or spool. This means that the outboard velocity would be equal to the inboard velocity. And if that's the case, and we observe that this outboard forward velocity and this inboard forward velocity are rotating about, or these points are rotating about the instant center with the same angular velocity, the translational velocities at the inboard and the outboard tires need to be different. But if the rotational velocities are constrained to be the same, yet we have this outboard velocity being greater than the inboard velocity, then we're going to need to have some sort of tire slipping for us to go around this curve. With all of these relationships defined, we can define what is the relationship between the outboard tire forward velocity and the inboard tire forward velocity. And that's going to be equal to our outboard divided by our inboard times the velocity of the inboard tire. If a differential is used, then we don't have to have this kinematic constraint. We can have a different velocity between the inboard and the outboard tires. And then this allows us to go around a curve without e either of the tires sliding. But as we learned in the last lecture, while we can have a different angular velocity, there is still a kinematic constraint. If omega d is the angular velocity of the differential housing, then we can write this constraint that this is equal to one half of the sum of the angular velocity of the outboard tire plus the angular velocity of the inboard tire. So here I'm going to label this to be more precise as the differential housing. And you may re remember just sketching out, thinking about how an automotive powertrain is laid out, at least for a conventional rear wheel drive vehicle. Here we have this drive shaft that's rotating about uh, its axis with some rotational velocity. And we have it connected with a, a U-joint to allow for some angular deformation. And then this drives the input pinion. And that input pinion is meshed with a ring gear. And this set is a hypoid gear set. And this is going to provide an additional speed reduction. But this ring gear, this is connected to the differential housing. And so this rotational velocity that I'm talking about right here, this is the angular velocity of this differential housing. There is a speed reduction typically between the drive shaft here and the angular velocity of the differential housing. If we assume that there's no tire slip, then just by nature of the tires being in contact with the ground, 
this provides an additional kinematic constraint. We can write that the forward velocity of the vehicle divided by the radius of curvature measured from the center of the vehicle is equal to the rotational velocity about the instant center. And then we can also write that as the ratio between the velocity, the forward velocity of the outboard tire to the radius of the outboard tire with respect to the instant center. And remember that is defined over here, r plus one half w. And then we can similarly define that as the forward velocity of the inboard tire divided by the radius or the distance from the inboard tire to the instant center. With that kinematic constraint, then we can write the forward velocity of the outboard tire is equal to the angular velocity about the instant center times the radius or the distance between the outboard tire and the instant center. We can also write that the forward velocity of the inboard tire is equal to the angular velocity about the instant center times the, in, the distance from the inboard tire to the instant center. Here we are going to assume that the forward velocity v and the radius, uh, the distance from the center of the vehicle to the instant center are known. And then we can write that v over r is equal to the angular velocity about the instant center. So therefore this quantity is known as well. We're going to assume here that we have a number of quantities that are either given or known. The forward velocity of the vehicle, v, r, the radius or the distance from the center of the vehicle to the instant center. And then here we have the force, this total tractive force that's required to maintain velocity v accounting for any resistive forces such as air resistance or rolling resistance. And then we have the track width w, we assume that's known, and then also the tire radius r sub t. This is going to help us to relate the angular velocity of the tires to the forward velocity at each of the tires, assuming that there's no tire slipping. There are a number of quantities that we're going to need to find. This includes the torque at the differential housing, the torque at the outboard tire, and the torque at the inboard tire. We also need to know what is the angular velocity of the differential housing, the angular velocity of the outboard tire, and the angular velocity of the inboard tire. First, let's have a look at input torque. The torque at the differential housing is going to be equal to the total tractive force times the tire radius. By definition, this is the total amount of force that's required to keep the car moving at velocity v, and the sum of the forces, the net force from the two tires, assuming this is a rear wheel drive car, must add up to this tractive force F. And the torque is ultimately going to come from the drive shaft, and the drive shaft torque is then going to be split across the wheels, and the, the total torque then is going to be this uh, drive shaft torque T sub D. We can also figure out the input speed of the drive shaft. We know what the vehicle velocity is, V, and then that's going to be equal to the differential housing angular velocity times the tire radius. And with that known, we, we know what the tire radius is, we know what the velocity is, so therefore we can solve for this differential housing angular velocity, and that's going to be equal to the vehicle forward velocity divided by the tire radius. Now let's have a look at road constraints and see what additional quantities we can derive based on those. The velocity of the outboard tire is equal to 
the radius from the outboard tire divided by the vehicle center radius times the forward velocity. We can also write that the forward velocity of the inboard tire is equal to the inboard tire radius over the vehicle center radius times the forward velocity of the vehicle. We also have the outboard tire angular velocity is equal to the outboard tire forward velocity divided by the tire radius. And then combining these together with substitution, we can write that the outboard tire angular velocity is equal to r sub o times v over r times rt. So this is another one of the unknowns. Here we have solved for the torque at the differential housing. And now we can work on solving the other quantities. Uh, let's see. This I should have mapped right there. The differential housing velocity is right there. And with one more piece of information that we obtained earlier, this inboard tire angular velocity, that's equal to the inboard tire forward velocity divided by the inboard tire radius to the instant center. And then that's going to be equal to r sub i times v divided by r times rt. So now we have the differential housing torque, or the input, input torque to the differential. We have the differential housing speed, the input speed to the differential. We also have the output or outboard tire speed, one of the output speeds. We now have the input, or sorry, the inboard tire angular velocity. So that's another one of the unknowns. We've very quickly gone through four of the six unknowns. Now all that's left is to identify the torque at the inboard and outboard tires. And this is going to require some additional relationships. If you recall back to the previous lecture, we went through a derivation of equilibrium equations based in this rotational reference frame, and also conservation of energy or power. And the result of that is we have the sum of all the torques involved with the differential must be equal to zero. Also, from conservation of energy, all of these power terms, the sum of each of the torques multiplied by its corresponding velocity, must be equal to zero. These were derived in the previous lecture. Now we can apply these and use these in deriving what the torques are. Instead of deriving the inboard and outboard tire velocities symbolically in terms of all of the knowns that we already have, I'm going to introduce here a numerical example and walk through the process of deriving all of these unknowns. Suppose we have an automotive differential, a vehicle analysis problem, and we are given a number of quantities that help us to characterize the kinematics and the velocity, uh, the velocities involved with this system. The forward velocity of the vehicle is 15 meters per second, and we're going to assume that we have steady conditions. In other words, the longitudinal acceleration of the vehicle is zero we're going to assume that we require 20 kilowatts of power to keep the vehicle moving forward to maintain a velocity of 15 meters per second. Here we're given that the track width of the vehicle is 1.8 meters. And instead of looking at or being given the radius or the distance from the vehicle's center to the instant center, we're going instead to be given the centripetal acceleration of this vehicle. So we're going around a curve and we are experiencing centripetal acceleration of 0.5 g's. This is a pretty hard cornering maneuver. 
Uh, it's not an ultimate limit of a vehicle, but it's, it's very non-trivial. And so we need to take this quantity and convert it to a quantity that allows us to calculate the unknowns for this differential analysis problem. We are also told that the effective radius of the tire is 0 0.32 meters. The first step we're going to take is to find the forward tractive force. We can start with the relationship that the power required to maintain the velocity v is equal to this tractive force times the longitudinal velocity. We don't know what the tractive force is, but we know what the other two quantities are. So we can write the tractive force is equal to the power divided by the velocity. The power is 20 kilowatts, and the velocity is 15 meters per second. And this turns out to be about 1.3 kilonewtons. The second step we're going to take is to find r, the distance from the vehicle center to the instant center. Going back to basic dynamics, the radius of curvature for a mass that is moving around an instant center is going to be equal to the tangential velocity squared divided by the centripetal acceleration. And we know both of those quantities. 15 squared divided by 0 0.5 g's, and in this unit system, that's 9.81 meters per second squared. This turns out to be 45.87 meters. Now this puts us in the same position that we were earlier as far as what quantities were we given to start off with. We have the total tractive force, and we have r. And then we also have the velocity, the power, the track width, and the tire radius. Now we can use the equations that we developed earlier to calculate what are the unknowns for this vehicle example. The rotational velocity of the differential housing, or uh, the input to the differential, is equal to v divided by the tire radius, or 15 meters per second divided by 0.32 meters. This is 46.875 radians per second. The torque at the differential housing, or the input torque to the differential, is equal to the tractive force times the tire radius or our 1.3 kilonewtons times 0.32 meters. This is equal to 426.56 newton meters. Let's have a look at the outboard tire first. The outboard tire angular velocity is equal to RO. This is the distance from the outboard tire to the instant center times the velocity divided by r times rt. This is equal to 46.77 times 15 divided by 45.87 times 0 0.32. Now, how did we come up with these numbers? Well, we have this 45.87 that we derived earlier from the centripetal acceleration, and the outboard radius, that is equal to r plus the track width divided by 2, and we have the track width here, 1.8, so it's r plus 0.9, and then we have ri, that's r minus w divided by 2. And uh, so then that's this 45.87 minus w over 2. And we're going to be using that in calculating the quantities related to the inboard tire. So once we run through 
these calculations, we get 47.79 radians per second for the outboard tire. And then the inboard tire velocity, that's going to be Ri times V divided by R times RT or 44.97, that's R minus one half W times 15 meters per second divided by 45.87 times 0 0.32 and that is equal to 45.96 radians per second. So we have a difference. Uh, if we think about what's going on kinematically again, suppose this is the instant center and that is the center of the vehicle with velocity v and then we have the inboard velocity and the outboard velocity if we have uh, if we compare these two angular velocities uh, then that gives us a sense of how much faster the outboard tire needs to spin relative to the inboard tire to make sure we don't have any tire scrubbing. Without the differential, we'd have a fair amount of slipping. We can calculate what these velocities are. So this VO is equal to the angular velocity of the outboard tire times the tire radius, and that's 15.29 meters per second. And the inboard velocity is equal to the inboard tire angular velocity times RT, and that turns out to be 14.71 meters per second. If we look at the difference between those, VO minus VI, that's 0.58 three meters per second. Just envision what this looks like. Uh, more than a half meter per second and one of those tires or both of them are going to be skidding at a velocity uh, that adds up to this amount. So just imagine a single tire being dragged across, dragged across a road at this velocity while supporting the weight of a vehicle. That's something we like to avoid. The final unknown quantities are the individual torques at each of the wheels. So here we can apply the equation of equilibrium and conservation of energy to derive these final quantities. From equilibrium, we can write that the torque at the outer wheel is equal to the torque at the differential housing, the input torque to the differential, minus the torque at the inboard wheel. Uh, so, in other words, the net torque at the differential, uh, it's, it's basically the sum of the, the torques at the two wheels. Now, what about power conservation? Here we have the torque at the inboard wheel times the angular velocity at the inboard wheel plus the torque at the outboard wheel times the angular velocity at the inboard wheel must be equal to the power input. So this is the power output of the differential, the mechanical power output, and then the power input is equal to the torque at the differential housing, the input torque, times the input speed, the differential housing input speed. That's the power input. So that's conservation of energy. And now we can go through and start solving for the unknown quantities. Let's use conservation of energy and solve for the input or inboard torque. So the inboard wheel torque is equal to the differential housing torque times the quantity omega d minus omega i over omega o minus omega i. We do the calculations and that turns out to be 213.3 newton meters. Now, because of the equilibrium equations, we can write this. We can solve for the torque 
of the outboard wheel. That's equal to the input torque minus the torque at the inboard wheel. And we solved earlier that the torque input is 426.56 newton meters. We subtract 213.3 newton meters. And the result is 213.3 newton meters. So these are the same. It turns out if we have an open differential, if there are no mechanisms that can shift the torque uh, in a biased way from one side to the other, as long as we have traction with an open differential, we are going to have the torque evenly split across the inboard wheels and the outboard wheels. This concludes this example. Thank you.